So this, this was interesting. This, the opening shot changed a number of times how we did it and what the shot was, but we ended on this very simple idea of just doing this continuous pull back so that you come off this bucolic landscape and you gradually reveal the world that our two characters are going to be immersed in. 1917 was undeniably one of the most remarkable films of 2020. Not only was the cinematography just stunning and immersive, but the story is one that can't be forgotten. So 1917 was one of my favourite films of 2020, and we were lucky to get it very early on in the year, as it just wouldn't have been the same on a 50 inch screen at home. Before I start, I think it's safe to say that the one shot wasn't just a gimmick, and whilst there was some negative feedback surrounding the use of the one shot technique, you can't argue that it doesn't fully immerse you in the story. In today's video, I want to look at the equipment Roger Deakins used, how they achieved the look of the one shot, and of course, the lighting. So unlike many of my other videos where we are continuously looking at the same equipment of an Alexa or Venice with good glass on sticks, there was actually a lot of thought that went into the choosing of the equipment on 1917, as not only does it have to look incredible, but it also has to fit on gimbals, motorbikes, wires, and do so seamlessly. Let's look at the camera first though, and I did write out a whole paragraph for this, but I think Deakins puts it best saying, In August, James and I approached Franz Krauss at Ari, who we had known for many years, and asked if Ari intended on making a smaller version of the Alexa LF. He said that they had it in mind, but not immediately. We asked if they could have three ready by February 2019, and they came back to us with a guarantee of three prototypes of the Alexa LF Mini by the time we came to shoot. I think if it hadn't been for Deakins being a long time user of Ari's cameras and friends of theirs, I'm not sure they would have had a camera to shoot with. Now they then paired this with Ari's signature primes, more specifically the 35mm, 40mm and 47mm. For me, the, the signatures are the cleanest I've seen. I like to shoot with natural light sources. I like to shoot with practicals. And often I'm shooting at something that's very bright, you know, and might be in quite a pin source. So I want something that flares as little as possible. I can't stand flares. I'm, I find anything, any artifact that is like on the surface of the image is a distraction for me. The audience or I am then aware that I'm looking at something that's been recorded with a camera. The weight of the signature primes was crucial as we needed a lightweight camera package for the various stabilizing systems we were using. Plus, they are fast and sharp and there's absolutely no breathing when you pull focus. I hate it when the image shifts when you change focus. This is the first case I've come across where a camera had been pretty much built for a film, but if you're going to build a camera for anyone, it's going to be Roger Deakins. Enough about the equipment though. How did Roger Deakins actually achieve the look of the one shot? Well, a lot of it is to do with the editing and VFX, but an equal amount is to do with the timing of each scene. If a single sentence is in the wrong place, then the timing for the next scene is out of place. They'll arrive at the start of the next scene either too late or too early and have to start again. When asked about the rehearsal process, Deakins replied, A lot. All of the camera moves and handovers required a lot of practice, and that was great fun. Every scene was rehearsed way in advance of production with the actors and crew. At first, we rehearsed with stakes in the grounds demarking the trench lines, but as production got closer, we took the camera equipment, our key crew members and actors to our locations, and mapped the moves and the timings much more precisely. To get more into the specifics of the cutting, they would either do it when a character crossed a frame, a camera passes in front of a foreground element, or when darkness fills the frame and that's probably the most noticeable one. I'll play a few of the cuts over this next quote though. The concept of the single take was in Sam's head as he wrote the script. One practical consideration we had was where we put the joins, but we also had to consider how we would physically hand the camera from one person or rig to the next whilst going through the trenches, up and over walls or around a building 
all with a stable image. They also opted to shoot only in cloudy weather, as it's not only right for the story, but it also allows for the continuous scenes without worrying about cloud placement. I did wonder about controlling the light, using rags above the trenches, but with over half a mile of trenching to cover, it would have been impractical, so I just took the gamble to wait for the weather and was very lucky. As I just said, there wasn't a lot of artificial light in this film, that is apart from one major scene, and it's the one set in a Kusim map. When planning the scene, they mapped out the lighting in an 8x4 foot model and would use small LEDs to show where the shadows would fall on the scene. They then built bright flares with variable burn times that would be hung from cranes and operated to go up and down on cue of the camera. Whilst talking about the lighting rig, Deakins puts it best, saying, The lighting rig, centred in the town square and standing in for the burning church, had a footprint of 60 foot by 30 foot. It was 50 foot high, with five tiers of light, a mix of maxi brutes and dinos, totalling around 2,000 1K bulbs in all. We lit the interiors of the old schoolhouse, where Schofield encounters the young German soldier, from that same light source through the windows. We also can't go without talking about the burning building. As tungsten light creates an orange-like hue, they just ran them at 20-30% in order to achieve the look. To add on to that, every light was on dimmers, which allowed them to adjust them to the camera movement, and whilst on set it just looked like a building with a few lights in the windows, after a bit of VFX work, it looked incredible. Any time I shoot a film, I want to put the audience in this world. Whether it's a fantasy world or a real world like 1917. Ultimately, the cinematography of 1917 is clearly some of the best we have ever seen, and, and that's Oscar why it won an Oscar. To Roger Deakins, 1917. We have beautifully composed shots with some incredible movement and stunning lighting, and it's all done whilst using the one-shot technique, which would have been hard on its own. It feels fully impossible to analyse work like this though. I mean, when you're looking at films shot by one of the best cinematographers of all time, there isn't much to build on apart from the fact of how he achieved it. I also feel like after four videos surrounding Deacon's work, I need to create a playlist just for his films. So if you have any other suggestions for cinematography breakdowns looking at his work, leave it in the comments down below. I hope you enjoyed this video looking at how Roger Deakins shot 1917. If you have a film or TV show that you would like to see me analyse, then leave a comment down below. If you found it informative, a like is appreciated, and if you would like to see more videos like this, then hit the subscribe button. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.